If you live in the Wallingford area, then a name that is very familiar to you, I'm sure, is the name of William Blackstone, or to give him his proper title, Judge Sir William Blackstone. You may have seen his name on, on the street, Blackstone Road, or of course you may have seen the blue plaque on the side of the town hall proclaiming that uh, the judge, Sir William Blackstone, presided here as recorder of Wallingford back in 1749 to 1770. But if you're like me, perhaps that is about the extent of your knowledge concerning this man. In fact, he's a very interesting character. And what I wasn't aware of, and you may not be either, is that he has left his mark, even to this day, on our legal system, on our system of justice. And not only in this country, in the UK, but also perhaps even more so in America. So we're going to just think about the judge, Sir William Blackstone, and what we can learn from him today. Just a little bit of background, and you can see here, uh, this is the tomb where he is buried. And if you want to, you can go to St. Peter's Church. It's all locked up these days, but you can get a key and go into St. Peter's Church and have a look and see his tomb. And you can see the memorial and, of course, the very fascinating spire of the St. Peter's Church, which was actually built uh, in his lifetime, I believe. So Blackstone held a 120-acre estate in Wallingford. One of the things he's most famous for is his writings. And uh, he wrote a series of commentaries on the laws of England. Um, and there were four of these books, which you can quite easily get hold of, copies of, and you can look at them online. And I, according to Wikipedia, you, we read, gave the law, these books gave the law at least a veneer of scholarly respectability. And uh, in America, the US academic Robert Ferguson noted that all our formative documents, and he quotes a few, including the Declaration of Independence, were drafted by attorneys steeped in Sir William Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England. And uh, he, he goes on to say, so much was this the case that the commentaries rank second only to the Bible as a literary and intellectual influence on the history of American institutions. And so I want to consider this for a moment and just think about it. And in particular, there's one uh, quote that comes from this book, from his commentaries, that I want to think about. As we explore the thought of what is right and what is wrong, and the thought of justice. So what did Blackstone say? Well, he, he came up with this famous ratio. It is better that ten guilty persons escape than that one innocent suffer. And... What he was probably um, going back to was, was the Bible. And if you were to look in Genesis in chapter 18, and we'll just read it. Genesis in chapter 18 says this. And uh, if you know your biblical history, you'll be aware of a wicked city called Sodom that was disobedient to God and was about to be judged. But Abraham was pleading for this city and pleading particularly for those who were innocent in the city. And he said that he pleaded with God and, and said, will you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Will you also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? And he goes on to write to say, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? 
And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And so what Blackstone realised was this, that it is better that 10 guilty persons escape than one innocent suffer. It is fundamentally unjust for innocent people to be punished for crimes that they did not commit. But then, well, what do we mean by guilty or innocent? And where did this concept come from? And ultimately, who decides who is guilty and innocent? Let's see if Judge Blackstone can shed some further light on it. So we need to know what is right and what is wrong. And uh, to that we go to law. And this is what Sir William Blackstone, not only a judge and solicitor general to the king, he was a an MP of the fame, one of the famous rotten boroughs. And he said this. No enactment of man can be considered law unless it conforms to the law of God. Man must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator. And so he goes on to say no human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. So what he was saying is this, that ultimately we are all accountable to God. God, our creator, is the final arbiter, the final authority. So what he said is, is not widely believed today. It's not accepted in legal circles, in the government and so on. But the Apostle Paul in the Bible who was a great legal mind himself, wrote this in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And so what the Bible is teaching is this, that the powers that be, governments and judges and so on, they have authority, but ultimately their authority comes from God. And that is what Blackstone, Sir William Blackstone, the judge, wrote in his famous books, the Commentaries on the Laws of England. So what does this actually mean in practice then? Well, the, if we go back to the, to the Bible, which records what God has written, as his law for this world. There are some things which continue to this day as, as quite uh, as accepted as right and wrong. Things that are in the Ten Commandments, such as you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't tell lies, etc. But in actual fact, God's requirements of us go deeper than this. And Blackstone really understood this too. But the point is this, that God judges not only our act, outward actions, if we should steal or, or murder, but the Bible tells us that he actually judges the very thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And we also read this in the Bible, that, that it is wrong if we do not give God the right place in our lives. What does this lead us to understand? It leads us to understand, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, and again, this is the, the great legal mind, the Apostle Paul, who had to confess and admit all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all come short. None of us stand up to God's scrutiny or God's laws. Yes, we may not be murderers, we may not steal, but as far as God is concerned, we're in the wrong. So who decides whether somebody's broken the law? Who is guilty 
or who is innocent. And so William Blackstone wrote a bit about this as well. And uh, he, he said this, that founders of the English laws have with excellent forecast contrived that no man should be called to answer to the king for any capital crime unless upon the preparatory accusation of twelve or more of his fellow subjects, the grand jury. And so what he was referring to was the jury system that we still have today. And the jury must weigh up the evidence to decide whether on the basis of evidence the crime has been committed. But, you know, with God, there is no doubt. There's no need for a jury. And the reason for this is God, our creator, God who we cannot understand. We cannot understand how the world came into being. It's not something that you can boil down into some theory that it we began with some uh, nothing became something and, and so on. No. When we accept that we are created by God and we realise that that God must be all-powerful, all-knowing and all-seeing, then we realise, as far as God is concerned, he has proclaimed that we all fall short. We're all guilty. That's what we read again from good old apostle, the apostle Paul. He said this, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And so we're all guilty before God. You know, this this understanding is what shaped this country. Today we, we live in an era of moral decline, moral relativity, where people can simply decide for themselves what is right or what is wrong. But by the way, please don't misunderstand me. Christians are not saying that we are better than anybody else. But a Christian is simply one who acknowledges their guilt before God, accepts their guilt, but have asked God for forgiveness and have been forgiven. Their sins have been forgiven by the almighty God. That's what makes a person a Christian. And of course, what the Bible is not saying is that when you become a Christian, you can carry on living your life just as you please, committing crimes left, right and centre and, and so on. But in fact, when you become a Christian, God gives you the strength and the power to live for him as you ought to. So then we move on to the, the thought about, well, what about punishment? And Sir William Blackstone had some thoughts on this as well. He said this, punishments of unreasonable severity, especially where indiscriminately afflicted, have less effect in preventing crimes and amending the manners of a people than such as are merciful in general, yet properly intermixed with due distinctions of severity. And so what he was saying was this, that the punishment must fit the crime must fit the crime. And so when we go turn to the Bible, we see quite clearly that God is a God also of punishment. That sin or crime will be punished by God. The psalmist acknowledged that. In Psalm 59, when he said, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Awake to punish all the nations. Do not be merciful to any wicked transgressors. But some might say, well, if God, it is God, uh, fair or right to punish people forever in hell, does that fit the crime? Or is it unreasonably severe, to, to use William Blackstone's words, 
we need to understand that God is the judge of all the earth, which is what Abraham said. We need to understand that our sins that we might think is, are just trivial. Maybe we've looked at something we shouldn't. Maybe we've told a little lie to somebody. These small things, maybe it's just a thought in our heads. But these things that might appear trivial to us, to God, God is a God of, of absolute righteousness. And it is within God's right, absolute right, to punish those who fall short of his standard for eternity in hell. But you know, there's one other very important thing, which means that God is righteous to punish. And that is God has provided a means that all can escape this punishment. None, in the words of a hymn, none need perish. None need be punished because God has provided a means of, of mercy. And before we finish this little talk, we need to just think about God's mercy. What scope is there for mercy or pardon? Well, William Blackstone said, said this. A pardon may also be conditional. That is, the king may extend his mercy upon what terms he pleases and may annex to his bounty a condition. And he goes on to explain that the one of the conditions of pardon might be that the person who's committed the crime should be exported to uh, a, a, another country, one of the colonies, such as Australia. Uh, and so on the basis that they would be exported to uh, uh, Australia or somewhere else, the king would pardon them for whatever crime they'd committed. So how can we be pardoned by the judge of all the earth? How is it possible when we think of our guilt? And yes, the Bible makes that plain. And, and I've, I've explained from the Bible the situation that we find our, ourselves in as guilty sinners. How can one day we be in heaven? How can we have our sins forgiven? How can we be pardoned? How is there mercy before God? Well, in the book of Hebrews, we write, we read, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And so down through the ages of time, God's means by which we can have mercy is on the basis of an innocent victim dying. And in the Old Testament of the Bible, these innocent victims were animals that were taken and killed upon an altar. Their blood was shed. Sins would be forgiven. But this came to an end when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world 2000 years ago. And instead of animals being taken and killed and blood being shed, it was his own blood. The Lord Jesus took the punishment for us. You see, the punishment cannot be escaped. The punishment must be carried out. But the Lord Jesus was willing to take the punishment in our place in my place and so our guilt can be erased we can have forgiveness of sins and be purified with the blood of the Lord Jesus so we might say well are all pardoned then well no the offer of pardon and forgiveness and mercy is there for all all can take it. But you know, with any free gift, you have to accept it. You have to receive it. You have to do that in faith. And today, as this little talk on, on William Blackstone and his influence on, on the law comes to an end, I'd like to ask you a question. Have you put your faith 
in the merciful God and, and put your trust in the death of his son, the Lord Jesus, as the means of forgiveness and mercy from God. You do trust that you have. May God bless you.